It's election time. Welcome to your Net Plus Big Crunch presidential debate, broadcasting live across Europe. The European elections on the 25th of May will decide Europe's direction for the next five years. For the next 75 minutes, four leading candidates for the presidency of the European Commission will be tested by journalists from 15 member states. It's a unique event in European democracy. And if you want to have your say, join us now on Facebook and Twitter. We will put your questions to the candidates team right after the debate. Follow this debate with hashtag RockEurope. Fighting for a place in history are, first of all, Jean-Claude Juncker for the Conservatives. Mr. Juncker is a former Prime Minister of Luxembourg and former President of the Eurogroup. Welcome. For the Greens, Ska Keller. Ms. Keller is a German member of the European Parliament and one of the two Green candidates for the presidency of the Commission. Welcome, Ms. Keller. And Martin Schulz for the Socialists. Mr. Schulz is a German member of the European Parliament and current president of the European Parliament. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And last but not least, Guy Verhofstadt, a former Belgian Prime Minister and the leader of the Liberals. Welcome. Thank you. The debate will be divided into five key topics affecting Europeans. Unemployment, austerity, immigration, energy and finance. Let's begin with unemployment, the main concern of European citizens. In the EU, almost 27 million of people are out of work, reaching dramatic levels of unemployment in countries like Greece or Spain. For the, uh, for the first question, we are going to go to Hungary. Our journalist Balash is there. Balash, can you hear me? Hi, Balash. Hello, good afternoon. <laughs> Hello, Balash. welcome. Yes, good afternoon. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Please tell us your question. Your question, Balash. So, thanks for the opportunity to ask you about unemployment. Since, since it is one of the biggest problems, despite signs of recovery. So, it will be important to create new jobs in Europe. We know that parts of the traditional European industry went far east in the last 20 years. But what sectors would you focus on to have economic growth which brings jobs? Keeping in mind that uh, member states have their own policy on this. Thank you, Valash, for your questions. Uh, now we are going to listen to the record question of Andrea, who is in Spain. Hi, first of all, I would like to thank you for attending to this meeting. The situation of unemployment jobs has caused a great deal of mistrust about what the politicians can do for the young people. The only solution offered to them is to leave their countries. So I would like to know what do you have to say to these uh, unemployment people which are desperate, not only from Spain, but from other countries which are facing the same problem. Can and once the European Union make something for them to help them? Great. And the last question comes from Portugal. Uh, Francisco, good afternoon. Welcome. Good afternoon. My Hello, question can you tell is, us your is, question? Yeah. is the following. The leader of one of the major Portuguese political parties proposes that part of the employment benefit be paid by the European Union. Would you support this proposal? Thank you, Francisco. Thank you for your clear question. Okay, so concerning unemployment, questions are what can the EU do to create jobs, having into account the current competences the EU has? Which economic sectors will you focus on in order to tackle employment? And should the EU pay a part of the unemployment benefit? We are going to start with Mr. Juncker, please. The, the European Union and uh, thus the Commission doesn't have all the tools in, in their hands to fight unemployment because to fight against uh, unemployment is uh, mainly a matter for national governments and the European Union has to cooperate intimately with national governments when it comes to, uh, to unemployment. I don't believe that uh, politicians can create uh, jobs. Jobs are created by, by companies and mainly by small and medium-sized uh, enterprises, but those who are uh, in political responsibility can create a certain number of preconditions leading to a, uh, an improvement of the employment situation in, uh, in Europe. I do think that uh, we have to, to make sure that uh, we'll have, after five years, a real unique digital uh, market which brings an added value of 250 billion uh, to the European economy and we have uh, to further develop and to complete 
the internal market, mainly in the uh, service sector, which brings another added value of uh, 250 uh, billions to the European economy, which as a whole makes, uh, five, makes a, a package of 500 billions, leading to more growth and leading to more uh, uh, employment. Then we have to, to exchange our best uh, practices. We are doing that, but uh, we are not copying in, the, in, the, in a proper way best practices in, in other countries, mainly as far as uh, vocational training is concerned. And we have to make sure that uh, young people unemployed can circulate uh, inside the European Union. We have to increase the mobility capacity of uh, young people. They are asking for that. We are not always uh, delivering. I would uh, like us to put into place a policy leading young Europeans uh, during their studies, during their vocational training, to spend at least six months, one year, in, an, in another uh, country. I think that these um, steps could, uh, could help us to fight this unacceptably high unemployment. But don't believe that the next commission, independently from whom will be the president of the commission, can, by its own efforts, without having the support of national governments, bring the unemployment uh, down. OK, I would like to hear Ms. Keller's opinion, please, on this topic. The European Union can set the right incentives in order to create jobs. And I think there we missed the big opportunity with the last multi-annual budget, like the budget for the next seven years, because we had proposed, and even some of the Commission proposals were going in the right direction, asking for research and development, for instance, on green technologies. And there it's a great pity that the two big groups have actually supported budget cuts in that area, because now with these budget cuts, we're not setting the right incentives in, for instance, developing further green technology and also other innovative areas and I think the sectors that are hugely important for, important for creating new jobs are exactly those that are also creating benefit for the whole of society in the area of renewable energies but also in the area of energy efficiency but also in education, healthcare because those are the sectors that really benefit to the society but that also give quality jobs, because I think it's also really important that we talk about quality jobs, not about unpaid internships for young people. Young people and everybody else needs quality jobs. And even the Commission is saying that with a bit more of effort in uh, reducing so CO2 emissions, you could create 6 million additional jobs by 2020. So this is a figure that we shouldn't like underestimate. There's really a lot of jobs there. And this is also something for young people. The youth guarantee that has been proposed for young people, nice start, but it's completely underfunded and indeed pushing young people into internships that don't lead anywhere, that doesn't help. On the last question, I think it's a very interesting idea, this having part of the unemployment benefit paid by the European level. And I think it's a good idea because it helps creating a balance also for the European Union. At the moment, we're having an unfair competition between member states, even though we're part of the same, same economic zone, partly even the same currency zone. We have a competition that is being done by dumping wages, etc. And this is not a good answer for the European Union. That's why I think we should have more common social aims, and part of this is also the support for the unemployment. Mr. Schul, now it's your turn. Uh, now, as uh, Ms. Keller was mentioning unpaid internships, in fact, uh, do you think it's an, unter an, in an unpaid internship a form of exploitation? I mean, is any job a good job? For sure not, and I think uh, this unpaid internship this is one of the biggest problems we have for more or less a whole generation of well-skilled and well-educated young men and women who are hired with a promise. Uh, if you, for six months, uh, work here unpaid, we uh, employ you, and after six months, this, the enterprise says, thank you very much for the six months, we take the next one. This is a modern uh, style of uh, exploitation. To answer to the three questions very concretely, first question from Hungary. I think our industry should try to develop a very specific European smart reindustrialization, which is combining energy efficiency with the development of modern products. So to invest in research development, in low consumption of energy, uh, and in renewable, and to invest in the grids we need to transport renewable energy around across the European Union, which is a precondition for energy union in Europe, but in the same time a tool to create enormous investment that creates also jobs. Secondly, 
the question uh, by the Spanish uh, colleague. Uh, this is one of the most important questions because we are running the risk that in some of our member states a whole generation is paying with their life chances for a crisis, crisis they have not caused. And therefore I think what is the best step to bring them immediately to jobs? My experience is in the, cri in the countries in which the unemployment rate is the highest, the backbone of the economy are small and middle enterprises with one big problem. This is the credit crunch. Their access to credits is not given. Therefore, they can't invest. Therefore, my proposal is via the European Investment Bank and the structured funds of the European budget to create a microcredit program for middle and small enterprises. And if they employ then young people, they should get a privilege on the interest rates or on the time of reimbursement. And on which is concerning the benefit of unemployment, I saw this proposal as well. That is a question which is very difficult because it needs European rules. We haven't. Therefore, I'm open for any debate, but I'm very prudent to make a promise to discuss that proposal. I find it very interesting. I share the view of Ms. Keller. But in election campaign, politicians should be very prudent not to make a promise. They can't keep after uh, the vote. And therefore, my answer to the third question is, I look, it, I look to it, I hear it very interested, but I can't make a promise. Okay. Mr. Verhofstadt, please, uh, I would like to ask you also, is it possible any kind of regulation from the European Union in order to, I don't know, for example, forbid unpaid traineeships or guarantee a minimum condition? Yeah, certainly there is, uh, uh, there we can do something, but uh, organizing a European unemployment scheme I don't understand how it could create jobs eh, for young people. Uh, create uh, jobs for young people. We don't need an, an, an unemployment uh, European scheme. We, we need something completely different. We need another uh, economic strategy in the European Union. Because let's face, first of all, uh, what is happening. We have badly managed this crisis uh, the last five years. And uh, badly managing this crisis because we are really stuck in this uh, discussion, uh, austerity, debt, austerity, debt. So we, we are going for austerity. Then some uh, others are saying hey, we need more debt. After that, we have created more debt. Uh, we need again austerity. So we need to come out of this, uh, of this discussion, austerity, debt, and, and find a way out means a new growth strategy that is breaking away uh, from uh, the recipes that have been used uh, uh, the last years. And um, my proposal is a strategy in which we use a jump forward in the uh, integration of the European Union in the uh, ma European market as an engine for growth. Take, for example, the banking union. If we have the banking union completely and not what we have today, then we can restore uh, the mechanism of uh, flowing mechanism of credits going to the small and medium companies was broken uh, today. Uh, secondly, a, a unified capital market. Today, uh, if you have an asset in the north of Europe, you cannot use it uh, to have a credit in the south of Europe because it are 28 different capital markets. So for interest rates going down, we need it. Other proposal, uh, a common energy community in Europe so that energy prices can uh, come down. And then uh, the digital market. We have still 28 telecom and digital markets. You use your, uh, your iPhone, you go uh, uh, from France uh, to Belgium or from Belgium to France, and you cannot use your iPhone for 20 kilometers. And that's the reason we, we don't have a Google, we don't have a Facebook, we don't have a Twitter. So what we are proposing in an intelligent way is stop making dApps, stop only to talk about austerity. Austerity is necessary because otherwise you cannot have growth on the long term. But we need a new growth strategy where we use a new jump forward in a European market as an engine for growth. Let's use the scale of Europe to emerge from the crisis. And certainly, uh, let's get rid of overregulation uh, as we certainly uh, the last 10 years have overproduced. Okay, now we're going to move on to austerity. Since the beginning of the crisis, austerity measures have been imposed as the remedy for Europe's failing economy. But after six years, more and more people are questioning the results. Uh, we're going to uh, go to Greece now with uh, Stavros. And do we have Stavros? Hi, Stavros. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon. Let's have your question. Yes, hello. Do you, do you hear me now? Yes, Stavros, let's have your question, please. Good afternoon from Athens. Mr. Juncker, you're saying that you want to reunite Europe. Can you explain us how, if next Commission President, you intend to counter the rigid economic policies in place and actually bridge the gap between the north and south of Europe? 
And a question to Mr. Schulz. In your speeches, Mr. Schulz, uh, you say that the European Union is in a bad shape and you intend to change this. Um, what is your top priority for this change to happen? And would you, for example, counter policies that have controversial results for countries such as Greece if you are the next president of the European Commission? Thank you. Let's uh, go to Germany with a video message from uh, Lisa in Germany. You ready to go with that? There's Lisa. Hi everybody, I'm Lisa Schöniger from AMS, the German Euronet Plus partner. And my question is about the European solidarity. In Germany, we currently have the situation that the economy is recovering from the crisis. We're doing pretty well. And many people fear now that this development could change again if we have to pay for other countries over and over again, such as Greece. So could you please explain why is it so important to take this responsibility? Thank you. And our third question in this uh, section, we go to Estonia and Lise by audio connection. Lise, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me well? We hear you very well. Let's have your question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Estonia wants to know what are the uh, concrete advantages of the austerity that uh, EU has applied for many years now. Uh, could you please give some examples of visible results. Thank you. Thank you so much. Scott Keller, let's start with you. Let's summarize these in, in two principles. Uh, why is solidarity amongst member states important? And has austerity worked? Clearly, austerity has not worked. It has actually destroyed something that I would call the European dream. I think if there is a dream that is shared by Europeans, if there's an ideal, then it's this idea of not letting anybody fall, of catching everybody, of supporting everybody. And this European dream has been broken by austerity. Austerity is leading to horrible results, to unemployment, youth unemployment, but it's also creating illnesses. People are not anymore able to pay their medicine in Greece. We have even in increasing child mortality in Greece. This is the situation that we're in right now in the European Union, in one of the richest areas of the world. So I think we really have to stop this austerity. It is leading us nowhere. Austerity has not brought forward any good result. It's not bringing forward growth. It's not creating jobs, not at all. We have to end austerity. Instead, we need European solidarity. We need to reinvigorate this European dream of solidarity, of living together, of caring for each other. And that's where the solidarity comes into play. And when uh, the German colleague was saying, like, why should we pay for Greece? Actually, currently, the German um, budget situation is so good because we're paying so little for state bonds because the Greeks are paying so much more. So it's a matter of imbalance that we're having in the European Union that are creating problems for different countries. And uh, But if the German economy wants to go on prosper, then we also have to think about who's going to import all the goods that Germany is exporting. And a lot of them go to other European markets. And if you're not having the possibility for people to buy all those German and goods that are being pro pro produced, then this is not good either for the German economy. So we need to rebalance Europe. We need to un understand and accept that we're living in a, in a common environment, that we have a shared economic zone. And for that, we need to balance things out. We can't have an internal competition about who has the lowest jobs, because also Germany has a crisis. We have a low um, income sphere. A lot of people are not earning anything to buy all the goods that they produce themselves. This is also a crisis. OK, Martin Schulz, let's give you an opportunity to answer that. But also, uh, the question was put to you, would you abolish the Troika? I start with uh, the question of the uh, Greek uh, uh, colleague. Uh, Europe is in a bad shape. Yes, the European Union was always a promise, not only for peace. It was a promise for more solidarity, for growth, for jobs, for cooperation across uh, borders between countries and nations to increase welfare and security for citizens. And let's be honest, uh, the promise for a lot of Europeans was broken. And therefore, there is an enormous mistrust, not only to European, by the way, also to national institutions. And uh, my conclusion is uh, to regain trust. Uh, we have to come to an end with uh, some of the uh, developments within the European Union, which are completely unacceptable. Speculants make 
millions of billions and billions of profits and don't pay taxes. And when they make billions and billions of losses, the taxpayers have to pay for that. This is not my Europe. And I think people who are disappointed, who think this is also a, a European Union they don't want to see, they are right. Therefore, I think we need in Europe a principle. And that if I would become the president of the commission, I would introduce the principle to suggest to the member states the country of the profit is the country of the tax. Today, we are living in the European Union where all taxpayers have to pay their taxes at home. But big enterprises, multinationals can transfer their profits in other countries where they have to pay low or no taxes. Therefore, uh, the, to regain trust and to put Europe in a better shape, I think another tax policy is very important, on which is concerning the Germans. I uh, am like uh, uh, Ska Keller, German. 35% of German uh, GDP is coming from the export. 60% of our export is going to the European Union. And those 40% on the world markets, to avoid that Germany will become dependent completely from worldwide developments, we should, in our own interest, stabilize the internal market of the European Union, by the way, also as a tool to protect our democracy, our values against other competing regions okay. in the world who are not uh, sharing our values and our standards. Okay. And on which, is concerning austerity, on which is concerning austerity, Austerity has not worked. Uh, austerity, the other way around, put Europe in a bad shape. Okay, yes or no answer. Would you also, abolish Troika. the Troika? Uh, we did here in the European Parliament with an overwhelming majority, uh, uh, we adopted a report by saying the Troika itself is not a problem. The goal of the Troika is to make itself super fluent. Okay. If they achieve, we don't need a Troika. But what they did, the Troika, the content of the Troika is completely wrong. Okay, maybe we'll come back to that later. Give a stats. Austerity, has it worked? No, I, I'm, I'm simply saying, those who are saying here that without budgetary discipline, you can emerge from the crisis. Sorry. Well, Pascal Kallen said it. Uh, you didn't say it for once, I should say. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, that's simply not so true. The, uh, same, the same joke. Yeah. Okay, okay. True. But uh, <laughs> a, budgetary, a budgetary discipline is necessary for growth on the, on the term and the long term. But, but it's growth. true that only budgetary discipline shall not emerge us from the crisis. That's true. No, no, we know we, we need a second track. <laughs> we need a growth strategy. But this growth strategy cannot be based again on making debts. And that is my, crit uh, my criticism to you. That is that you use again a new debts as the way to come out from the crisis. I think you need another strategy. I explained it in my first uh, uh, intervention, using the market, more integration in Europe as the engine for growth. That said about the Troika, because I don't want to escape uh, that uh, question. Troika for me is a technical issue. It has to be a technical team and not taking the political responsibility. We as European Parliament and as a future commission have to take that. And then finally, on Greece, let's say it like it is. The real reason of the difficulties in Greece are not Europe, are the clientelistic system existing in the country. Both parties, the PASOK and the Nea Demokratia, have made a clientelistic system in which everybody has to pay for health services, for, for everything in their society. Uh, professions are not open, the markets are not open, are, uh, the banks are public banks who are in a bad shape. That's the problem from Greece. And the problem is that both parties are still continuing in the actual government. There needs to be a revolution in the politics in Greece themselves if we want to emerge. And then finally, on Germany, uh, on Germany, I, I agree, but there is a problem. Taxpayers in Germany, I understand them, don't want to pay any more for everything. But there is a simple re uh, a solution for that. Let's uh, make a system in which the bondholders receive less interest rates. Instead of asking to German taxpayers, Belgium taxpayers, Luxembourg taxpayers, Dutch taxpayers to pay the high interest rates uh, on bonds that we are paying in Italy, in Greece, in <clears throat> Portugal, and so on. And the system exists, the redemption fund. That could be uh, the solution uh, for the problem. Let me bring back to uh, Mr. Juncker. You were a prime advocate of austerity. Did it go too far? I'm not a uh, fan of austerity. I'm in favor of uh, fiscal rigor, because without fiscal rigor, we cannot bring uh, Europe out of uh, the crisis. But uh, cutting budget deficits, lowering 
public debt levels is not enough. We need uh, another. Uh, well, my question was: Did it go too far? Because the, the, did it go too far? The studies that uh, you based your strategy on were proven to be flawed. That after the 95% uh, of GDP, uh, the growth the growth slows. That was your argument. So you have got to cut the, the debt right back. I don't know why you are addressing me by saying that was your argument. That was never my argument. But this was the austerity don't argument. Don't confuse me with the IMF. These are two different uh, uh, things. I was always in favor of uh, organizing the intersection between solidarity and solidity in Greece and in other countries, highly indebted and countries with high deficits. It was not possible to continue this kind of uh, uh, policy, and we had to impose a certain number of uh, measures. But imposing uh, budgetary measures on, on countries, be it by the Troika, by the Eurogroup, by the European Council, by whomsoever, is not enough. That's the reason why, back in 2009 and 2008, uh, uh, we launched uh, investment packages, coordinated at the European level, 250 billion in 2008, 120 billion in 2009, trying to, to put into place a so-called uh, anti-cyclical policy that was done and this effort has to be continued. We need investments in um, various areas. I mentioned digital market, I mentioned single market, Mrs. Keller was uh, mentioning uh, renewables, research, innovation, all these things have to be undertaken. But uh, don't believe that you can create a uh, growth friendly uh, overall situation by increasing debt and by increasing deficits. But how deficits. do you increase growth when there's no Pardon, liquidity? I, how do you increase growth when there's no liquidity in the market to invest to create employment? I, I don't think that there is no liquidity in the market. It's 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 obvious that banks have to change their uh, behavior. Banks were helped. Nor the Commission. The credit, the credit uh, crunch yeah, is the biggest Sean problem, Claude, I, I disagree. but you don't, I disagree. you don't solve it by making more yeah. debts on the public level. What you have to do is that banks are, again, giving credits yeah. uh, to the private sector. And that is possible if you have your banking union. If trusts come back in the banks, automatically these banks shall give uh, money uh, to the small and medium companies. Uh, and by unifying our capital markets, then that's come back, but I not slightly, by making more public debt. I, I slightly disagree, Jean-Claude. Uh, Mr. Juga, I wanted to, to, to remember you that the credit crunch in some of the member states is really a big problem and I disagree yeah. with you as well <laughs> because the problem is that banks partially those saved by taxpayers money get for 0.25 percent interest rate money from the ECB and instead to invest it in real economy they are once more speculating with the money so I agree exactly. banking That's union banking union is necessary but further regulation especially against this irresponsible speculation. This is key, by the way, to avoid, and if you are always speaking about increasing debts, most of the debts of the countries, the increase of the sovereign debt is a result of the banking yeah. crisis. Yeah. But you cannot regulate the fact that banks have to give money to the small and medium companies. If it was so easy, tomorrow we make a regulation and saying banks give you money. But when you're you need, bank, you, yeah. need, you need to change your environment. You need your banking union. You need the ECB together with the European Mr. Investment Mr. Bank and the Commission really to launch a, a, a real policy of credits, microcredits you call them, and is, to the really, small and medium companies. Really and that's not by a regulation that you can do that. I know really socialist have a little uh, bit uh, yeah. regulation, regulation, regulation. He's, I don't, he's really, don't do it. He's he's really really got us into this no, mess no, in the first smart, place, did he's it He's a smart guy. Uh, he is a little bit like uh, Mark Twain when he spoke <laughs> about Wagner, this German uh, musician. Uh, he said that the music of Wagner is not as bad as it sounds. So it is a little uh, bit uh, the oh, other oh, way around. Don't, don't uh, say, uh, my, my, my father was a, an, an amateur of Wagner. I, 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 no, I wake up a, every weekend with uh, Wagner. Uh, so yeah, yeah. we can talk about this that if you want. This is tangible. Therefore, you became a liberal. Huh? Let's <laughs> finish the segment uh, with Ms. Keller. Austerity, there has to be an end to this at some point. When do we finish? Austerity should finish as quickly as any are possible. And if I was Commission President, I would take any uh, steps to stop austerity because I also don't agree with what you said, Mr. Verhofstadt, and that we, we cannot invest anymore. You are saying we should not invest in our future. But for me, the biggest step that we're currently leaving to next and also current generations is a dysfunctional educational system, a non-working medical system. Hospitals are closing. We're leaving a huge 
social debt to the people in Greece, in Spain, everywhere, homelessness, child mortality, all those things, that is debt and we shouldn't ignore that social debt. In order to overcome that, we need investments, investment into the future and the crisis that we're living in. It's not just the debt crisis, Mr. Schulz has explained that the debt was partly cause of, uh, like, like consequence of the crisis. The, at the cause, at the root of this crisis lies a huge social inequality, capital that's just being like speculated okay. with on okay, all we... levels and this is creating huge banking problems. This has brought us into the crisis. Thank you. We need to move to the following topic. Uh, our third topic is migration and mobility. Freedom of movement and the arrival of illegal immigration have become key topics over the last months. For this uh, topic, we are going to start with Delphine, our journalist in France. Good afternoon, Delphine. Hello, Delphine, can you hear us? Hello? <laughs> Delphine's going for coffee. Yeah. Give it... No. Okay, she can't hear the audio. Let's move on to the, the next segment in just a moment. Yeah, let's move to the next question. Florine is in Romania. I was going to hear the recorded question from Florine. Good afternoon from Bucharest. I'm Florin Orban from Radio Romania. As you know, Bulgaria and Romania members of the European Union since seven years now are still not admitted in the free circulation Schengen area and that makes us feel as second-class Europeans. How do you plan as future executive leaders of the United Europe to apply the EU laws and regulations in order to give us, like to the other European citizens, the right to travel border-free in the European Union? Thank you, Florine. Now we are going to hear the question from Italy by Audio Connection. Good afternoon, Gigi. Buon pomeriggio. Good afternoon. Which is your question, please? Buonasera. Good. Buonasera, lei, and thank you for being here. <laughs> the question is uh, uh, very uh, stringent because just today the Italian foreign minister announced that there are 800,000 people ready to leave northern African coast for Europe, I would say, slash Italy, southern shore. Italian Interior Minister Angelino Alfano complains about the selfishness of the 28 EU states asked to change the mechanism of acceptance and management of immigration and of migrants and asked to expand significantly the system Frontex and its capacity. So the question is, it has come the time to share the burden more than what we did in the past. Thank you. Gigi, we are going to give a last chance to the question coming from France. Good afternoon, Delphine. Can you hear us now? It seems it's working. Hi, yeah, Delphine. It's working. Hi. Um, Hello, good afternoon. Some say that immigration should be the solution to uh, Europe's uh, aging population. Do you agree with that? Or do you think that the EU should uh, implement measures to, to boost the, the, the child rate? Thank you, Delphine, for your question. So, regarding immigration and mobility, the three questions are... Yeah, okay. Is immigration the solution to Europe's old population? Second question, what are your plans for Romania and Bulgaria concerning the, Sch the Schengen Free Circulation Area? And should member states of the north of Europe show more solidarity when dealing with illegal immigration? And we are going to start now with Mr. Schulz, please. Yeah. I think uh, immigration is a contribution uh, to the development, economic and uh, to the uh, society development in Europe. That it is the solution for the European society, I doubt. We need also children and I think uh, therefore to increase uh, the support for families and uh, for uh, increasing the birth rate, I think this is uh, reasonable. It is also, by the way, uh, normal that every country, every nation tries to get the next generation. Secondly, I uh, think that we need a legal system of immigration in Europe. What we have today is uh, the abuse of uh, the absence of a uh, legal uh, migration system, immigration system. There is worldwide a European immigration in other regions. Europeans are leaving from Europe, are immigrating to the United States, uh, to Canada, to New Zealand, or Australia. All these big regions of immigration have rules. The European Union hasn't. And therefore, I think we need uh, a rule how to immigrate in Europe. And the precondition is that we have a sharing of quotas between the 28 member states of the European Union. I'm here in this house since 20 years. I was in my first mandate the spokesman of my group for the item. If I replace the date I could help my speeches 20 years ago today, Nothing has developed. 
this is one of the biggest problems. And the last question, um, I think the uh, Europeans should uh, take into account that uh, uh, the member states in the southern area of Europe are really strongly affected, not only Italy alone. It is Spain, it is Greece, it is Cyprus, it is Malta, small country with an enormous problem. Therefore, solidarity uh, is absolutely key. And solidarity means that we have uh, to discuss with the member states that in the frame of their capacity, they, they have to take the necessary quotas by uh, the way also for political refugees and for those ref refugees who are coming from civil war regions. Last question, we are a community of law. And uh, in a community of law, there are rules and preconditions to get access to the policies of the European Union. And the Schengen uh, Treaty has a lot of preconditions. Once a country has fulfilled the criteria, it has a right of access. What happened here was that a Countries fulfilled the criteria, and in the Council were introduced new elements. Okay. This is arbitrage, and therefore, once more, in the next verification, if they fulfill the criteria, we should avoid that people have the feeling of first and second class citizens in Europe. Okay, thank you. Now we are going to go with Mr. Verhofstadt. I would like to ask you, freedom of movement in the European Union is one of the most visible successes yeah. for European citizens. Exactly. However, some member states are putting this right under question. Exactly. So, don't you think that this, the fact that they are questioning this right is a sign, a clear sign of the breakdown of Europe? Well, uh, I think this uh, labor mobility is essential, uh, but you have to make the difference. Uh, we are talking about two different topics yeah, here. Migration the coming from outside the European Union and then the mobility inside mm -hmm. the European Union. So on the uh, in migration coming from outside, I think we need a legal migration policy the fastest as possible. And that's the only way to tackle illegal migration and human trafficking. If you don't have a coherent, well-ordered uh, uh, legal migration policy. And, and, and also to, to strengthen uh, Frontex, that shall be uh, necessary. But if we don't have a legal migration policy, then the pressure of illegal migration becomes unsustainable. And that is what we are living uh, today. But on the other point, uh, mobility, that's another issue. Uh, labor mobility, in fact, instead of what uh, Eurosceptics are saying in many countries, is very low in Europe. If you look to the figures, we have only a labor mobility of 2.5%. That's four times less than in America. In America, they have 10% of labor mobility. That means that 10% of the population works in another state and their state of origin. And with us, it is 2.5%. But what is the problem is that... Uh, uh, this labor mobility is under threat because Eurosceptics and also a number of national governments are saying yes, but there is welfare shopping and when these people, Bulgarians and Romanians, they shall come in, they shall use all social benefits. That is what is happening. We are mixing, in fact, labor mobility and welfare shopping. And that's the reason why I think Europe has to come in to, first of all, defend labor mobility because it's key for our growth. Four million jobs are vacant for the moment inside the European Union. And the second thing we have to do, we have to develop a European system in which we can avoid welfare shopping, in which we say, uh, for somebody coming from Bulgaria, from Romania, of another country, we have a European um, uh, 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 scheme that is ready, uh, so a mobility scheme that is ready, so that they have minimum rights based on their country of origin, so that they don't can do on welfare shopping, for example, in Britain, for example, in another country. And so with such a system of a European mobility scheme, you encourage labor mobility because that's keen for our growth without falling in welfare shopping okay. where so many people are afraid of. Okay, thank you. We are going to go now to Mr. Juncker. We were talking about solidarity among, between the South and the North, between the North and the South, let's say, uh, about uh, illegal immigration, asylum seekers. How do we materialize this solidarity? Is the solution more money to the South, more border control? When it comes to uh, uh, migration to illegal uh, migration, member states of the European Union has to adopt a, a, a solidarity uh, profile. Uh, first, I do think that uh, the European Union will need immigration over the next uh, decades, not only uh, because uh, the population is aging, but it's enriching. Immigration very often is enriching a, a society. Second, I do think that we have to work on, on legal 
uh, migration, there I'm, I'm joining those who are requesting that. Third, I do think that as far as asylum seekers and refugees are concerned, we have to try to contribute to the resolution of the problems where they are created. I would like member states of the European Union to increase their aid development instead of, instead of reducing their uh, aid development uh, program. That's a major mistake that in the crisis we are first hitting those who are uh, having major problems uh, far away uh, from here. I do think that uh, solidarity has to be organized in a uh, target-oriented way. I do think that uh, we need a stronger financial solidarity by those who have the means in order to support those who are the first victims, I don't like the expression, of uh, illegal uh, immigration. I do think that uh, as a European Union, we have to co-finance via the budgets of uh, member states the, uh, okay, the, high costs of, the, high costs of the, of the high costs of the return programs. Malta, Italy, Greece, they have to pay for the return programs. Other, your party other, doesn't really other, take that perspective, does it? I, I, I don't, on the, on the, the right, the Conservatives, you know, they are the most opposed to immigration. They're the most opposed to sharing the burden. So this must be your personal perspective. You have to, to read... Uh, uh, the programs of the different uh, parties of my uh, European uh, party. You are asking me, I'm giving you uh, my answer. I will convince those in other parties and those in my party who are not, uh, not sharing these views. And we have to transform the European approach when it comes to these uh, uh, problems and, and, uh, and we'll do it. How would you do it? How would you make the transformation? I was just explaining before you were interrupting me that we have to co-finance the return programs. We cannot leave poorer countries with the costs of all these uh, return programs. And uh, uh, that's exactly there where we have uh, to show more, more solidarity between richer and, uh, and poorer European countries. We have to increase the uh, protection of our external uh, borders. And we have to accept that those countries fulfilling the criteria of joining uh, the Schengen area should be admitted. The outgoing commission was uh, proving that Romania and Bulgaria have fulfilled the criteria. It's two or three member states which are refusing that, by the way, not led by Christian Democrats and by Conservatives, but by others. Thank you. One of them. Skakeler, uh, how do we deal with illegal immigration in Europe? Well, first of all, it's very interesting to hear that there's a broad consensus here on legal migration. I'm, the member, I'm a member of the Home Affairs Committee in the European Parliament, which deals with this issue, where it's impossible to get a majority on legal migration. And the Commissioner on Home Affairs has actually also said that no member state was supporting any proposals um, to legal migration. But it's very nice that once we, after the European elections, I'm, I'm sure we'll find a consensus on that. Also, very good. I'm very happy to hear that there is a broad consensus also on safeguarding the free movement within the Schengen area. Unfortunately, all of your different political groups have voted for introducing temporary border controls within the Schengen oh, area. No, yes, no, the no, Alder. It's, it's true. Completely no, it's true. No, no, true. Okay, after the debate, I'll <laughs> I show you. The... No, no, no. It's not after debate. We have to explain it now that it's untrue what you said. Wait. That we have safeguard that the Schengen. A key uh, is still applicable. Okay, but and, and the I exception that is made was to counter uh, proposals by the Council to end the Schengen Aki. Could it's I the opposite. Could I I to as the opposite yes, of what you're I, saying. We're going to leave Skakeler to answer Let this finish. question, please. Yes, okay. if I may please finish. I mean, you were talking Sorry. already, and I'm looking at the, at the votes that yeah, we had. And it's a public yeah. information. If you want to challenge it, then you maybe talk to the European Parliament Publication uh, Department, because that's also the information that's out in the public. So. If you really take a different stance, then you might want to correct that. Is it possible and, to raise um, a question to him? Yeah. Okay. After. You, you, you yeah. say afterwards. We have a very short time. It's very we have nice to go to the okay. connections. Yeah, yeah, I want to get back to it. Yeah. That's sure. in the end what we had a majority, what there was a majority for, and it was uh, us who voted against having this temporary uh, border control introductions. On a migration towards the European Union, I think it's a really important topic. On the one hand, sure, there is legal migration, which is a big problem. Like, we should enable that. And by the way, I still refuse to talk about people as a burden for member states. People are people. They're human beings who are coming in need for Look, looking for either better life or in need of protection. And there is indeed a great amount that the European Union could do much better. Let's look at the Syrian refugee crisis. 
outside Syria, then there's more than three million refugees. They are in Lebanon, they are in Jordan, they are in Turkey, where the states are taking okay. care of the Quick refugees. Question, Mark Schultz. Um, Wait, I, no, I'm no, like, no. come on, I didn't have no. at all any possibility to say anything on migration because I was interrupted. And I would Sorry. like to make the point that the European Union should do much no, more in taking on refugees because at the moment we're taking on ridiculous numbers and even those resettlement programs are not being fulfilled. I would like to make that point. The European Union has to do much more. If we want to take the Nobel Peace Prize, then we also have to show our responsibility towards those people who are in need of protection. Okay, I discuss it with her after the, uh, it's not so important. Very gentlemanly. <laughs> no, okay. You. Let's uh, move on to our next uh, topic. Uh, we're going on to energy. Uh, the crisis in Ukraine has uh, put energy security at the, uh, at the top of Europe's agenda. How do we protect our energy supply and uh, at the same time meet our climate demands? Uh, we're going to come to a satellite connection in, in a moment. Uh, this is something which uh, we're going to go to the core question first, but the, 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 this whole issue has changed. You know, six months ago, we were talking about energy in a totally different context. Today, it's in the context of foreign affairs. So let's hear our, our first audio question. Hello from Poland. The Polish Prime Minister Donald Tusk called for an energy union within the European Union in order to gain energetic independence from Russia. He also suggested that the EU should pay up to 75% of the costs for the gas infrastructure needed to be able to create the efficient network. So what do you think? Does the EU need such an energy union? That was Agata in Poland. Thank you. Let's go to our next uh, question. Good afternoon from Zagreb. Everyone agrees that Europe needs to improve its energy security. That has become a mantra of EU politicians and national governments alike. But there is far less consensus when it comes to possibilities to achieving it. So my questions are, should we use nuclear power and should Europe welcome fracking or shale gas extraction? Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, Barbara in Croatia. Uh, are we ready for a satellite connection? Okay, we will come to that in a moment. So let's, uh, let's start with uh, nuclear energy and fracking. Scott Keller. <laughs> nope. Why? We don't want nuclear energy because it's a high-risk technology that is also not clean if we look, for instance, at uranium mining. And it's also not cheap because all of us, all taxpayers, are paying the subsidies for nuclear energy in case of a catastrophe, we would all pay the waste management, so to say. We would have huge areas devastated. So no to nuclear very, very clearly. And also no to fracking, because this is also a very unsafe technology. And we're seeing already the consequences throughout Europe. So this is the wrong answer. The right answer is to invest into renewable energy, but also into energy efficiency. And yes, we need to become more energy independent. We shouldn't rely on Russian oil and Russian gas. We have to look at our own resources. But the European Union resources, that is wind, that is sun, that is the stuff that is renewable that we're not going, going okay. to run out of. And this is what we need to invest in with our European Union budget as well as in the member states. Okay, we're going to come back to you in just a moment. We've got our uh, audio line. Yes, hello. Hi, how are you? Thank you. This is Latvia Artoms. How are you? Yes, I'm good. Well, speaking about the energy union, I have another question. The Latvian president made a very particular proposal. He suggests to have a very common contract between all EU member states and Russian company Gazprom. That could potentially ensure a better gas price, especially for smaller member states, and would reduce the ability of Russia to use energy as a political weapon. So would you support, support signing a common contract between the EU and Gazprom? Okay, let's go to Mr. Juncker. And uh, would you support this? Yes, I would support this. This is part, by the way, of the ideas put forward by the Polish uh, Prime Minister Donald Tusk and supported by the French President, if I'm, uh, I'm well informed. I, I do think that we would have a different negotiation power if we would try to pool our uh, energy uh, demands. We have to lower and to reduce our uh, dependency on, on Russia for, for obvious economic reasons, but also for, for political reasons. And if we can bring gas from the east to the west, we have 
to put us into the technical possibility to bring the, the gas from, from the west to the, to the east. We have to diversify our uh, energy uh, supply in, uh, in Europe. We have to enter negotiations with different parts of the world in order to be less dependent uh, on, uh, uh, on Russia. And energy efficiency is of, the, uh, is of the importance. It's not when I'm talking about the necessity we have to create an energy union. It's not only about the channels, about supply. It's also about the right and proper energy efficiency supporting policy we have to put into place in Europe. As far as nuclear and fracking is concerned, I have to repeat what I already said elsewhere. This, the question of the energy mix is a question of national responsibility. I always let governments who were against nuclear and who were against uh, fracking, but energy mix is a matter for national member states. Uh, okay, let me go to Mr. Verhofstadt. If you, sorry, but if you say that the energy mix is uh, something on the national level, then we shall never have our European energy community that we want. I, I am have just the opposite uh, view about it. I think that you have to put the decision on the energy mix in Europe on the European level. And secondly, that you have also to put the uh, establishment of a grid, uh, a network, also on the European level. And there you have to decide what type of imports you want and what type of energy mix you want. Because let's be honest, it's a little bit uh, hypocritical what is happening now when there is the energy wind in, in Germany, but they are importing nuclear energy from France. Well, it's easy to, be, uh, to make an energy wind in, in, in Germany and then to import uh, a number of kilowatts coming from France and made by a nuclear power plant. So, uh, sorry, let's do it on the European level. Then this, uh, hypo uh, this, this way of uh, dealing and wheeling is not longer possible. So, and I think that an energy mix shall be necessary. I like renewables. The more renewables, the, the better it is. This. But in any way, it shall be a mix. And secondly, uh, it means a European community uh, that means that the decision of where we are putting uh, energy in, now it's coming mostly from the east and it's go to the west. We need also to have the possibility to have entrance points in the west, that energy can come, for example, from other uh, continents in the west and then to the east, the and from the agreement. south to the north, and, from, and that's the grid. And for the grid, we need huge amounts of uh, infrastructure, and that's the reason why my first priority as president of the Commission shall be to put that energy community, European energy community, on the table of the Council and uh, of the Parliament. Okay, and uh, Martin Schulz, you would sweep it straight back off the table, yeah? I'm, I'm fascinated. Uh, the world of kids. That's good, that's good. Yeah, that you're fascinated. Yeah, wait, wait, the, wait a moment. Wait a moment. I'm fascinated. The world of Kiefer Hofstadt huh? sounds <laughs> nice, but it's a little it's bit beside Europe. the reality. So Germany is not only importing nuclear energy, we are still using nuclear plants in Germany. The Energiewende, mm -hmm. wonderful pronounced, is the goal to come to an end with the use of nuclear energy, carbon based energy and to replace it by renewables and energy efficient products and plants. And the third industrial country of the world with an increased energy demand tries to leave from nuclear energy, to leave from carbon-based carbon energy and to replace it by renewables. This is a unique project, and if we achieve in Germany, I think we should discuss if this is also possible on, on, a, European on a European That's level. Therefore, I'm, I'm happy that you support <laughs> the Energiewende. And yeah. now, I think without imports we need, of nuclear energy from France. Okay. Yeah, wait a minute. Okay. We need <laughs> we need the investment on, in grids, creating jobs. We started with this. This is a project all so over Europe. We could spend away out of recession, huh? Pardon? We could spend away out of recession on an energy project. This is an enormous project to, to need the grids for the energy union. You need the necessary infrastructure to invest in the infrastructure. This creates jobs, growth, and less dependence from the energy supply from outside uh, European regions. On which is concerning uh, the contract with the Russians, yesterday I was called by him as naive when I said besides sanctions, we should discuss about common and shared interests. It's exactly what the Latvian president proposed. These are common and shared interests which could help us to re re reduce the tension around Ukraine. I agree entirely.
Let's go back to Ska Keller because she was interrupted <laughs> before. Uh, should you have a common position concerning fracking and nuclear energy? Because concerning climate change, there are no borders. If something happens in one country, the others are going to be affected. Indeed, and it's a strange coincidence that nuclear power plants are usually built very close to the border. So indeed, it's a European concern. And if, one, uh, if there is a problem with a nuclear power plant in one country, we're all going to be affected. So yes, I think indeed that we should coordinate much closer on the European level and really go for the renewables at the European level because like this we save the planet but we also create the jobs, the jobs that are here to stay for the next 20-30 years and that create good employment. And we shouldn't forget that energy is also a social question like whether the question of whether you can afford your energy or whether you're living in polluted areas. I'm from a coal mining area where people are suffering, have been suffering a long time from pollution and are now being threatened to be thrown out of their houses because there is mining going on and the mining is expanding even though Though the region is self-sufficient in renewable energy and it's madness that people are driven off their homes and villages that are century old um, just because in order to uh, increase the profits of some coal mining companies. So it's also a social issue. We shouldn't forget that. Okay, well fracking for you is a bad word. Uh, yes, indeed, it's a very bad word. But we now live in a world where security of people in small communities as well as, as cities really depends on the steady flow of gas and, and of energy of different types. And now we're being threatened by Russia and uh, by other complex situations across the world, not just uh, by supply, but also increase in price. We're in an incredibly difficult moment financially as well, and fracking's there to deliver a quick result at a, a, an achievable cost. Uh, would you tolerate fracking in the medium term to achieve renewable energy in the long term? Fracking is by no means cheap and it's also not just readily available. It's also a high risk technology. You're pumping chemicals into the ground where nobody knows yet what exactly is going to be the effect of that. I don't know if you want that to happen in your area, in your environment, but we don't where want you're taking the gas out the ground. To stop in Europe either. And uh, we, I mean, I can safely say that we Greens, we've been advocating for renewable energies ever since we existed. So we're not coming okay, late on that. Okay, let me ask Mr. Yonko. Mr. Yonko, uh, should we tolerate fracking in the short term to, uh, and put some of the investment in that into renewable energy for the long term? As I said, energy mix is a matter for national member states. I'm not in favor of fracking because we don't know about the real consequences. We don't know about the end cost of uh, fracking. So I, I think that uh, further research has to be done in, in that uh, in that domain, but for the time being, this technique is not sufficiently developed that we can give the European impetus to use that technology. So my remaining question okay. answer is, energy mix is for, for member uh, okay. states. And that's let me not, ask that's um, not module, same question. Fracking in the immediate term to, and the finance uh, renewables in the long term? I think fracking is not a solution. I'm uh, like Miss Keller. I was very long time the mayor of a uh, former coal mining city. I have the I know the same problems. Fracking is an unknown technology, but we should be clear: it will happen. Fracking will be decided. It is in the hand of the member states, and I'm absolutely sure that there will be member states who will allow fracking. Other member states not. The Americans have already decided. Uh, the, the real question is not fracking, yes or not. The real question is which is the most efficient strategy to make Europe independent from energy supply, from dictatorships, from countries who could combine our energy dependence uh, with political pressure they make on us. And this is the important point. And here is my feeling that the only way to achieve on the long term is renewable energy and the combination between reindustrialization and renewables, energy efficiency, to develop low consumption products. Uh, this is, in my eyes, an industrial program of Europe for the export in other parts okay. of the world. Here we can combine sustainability okay. with reindustrialization. This is, in my eyes, the best way. So, do the Liberals consider fracking a bad word also? We consider it if, first of all, there is proof of it scientifically that there is no bad consequences for the environment. Is so there an energy source that has no, no bad consequences? No, we have said uh, that uh, from the beginning, first of all, proof of that scientifically, there is no damaging of the environment, then you only can start. And, and that's also the acceptance of citizens. And it, that is also the the, the position of the European Parliament, that's it. 
little bit also hypocritical, typical for Europeans, because we shall uh, import in the next years uh, a number of energy sources, also gas coming from the US, and in this uh, gas shall be cracking uh, gas. Okay, our final theme for the presidential debate is finance. The crisis started with a rapid financial collapse. Let's hear what our candidates' proposals are going to be uh, for the financial system. Uh, we're going to go uh, try to go to Slovenia. Do we have Slovenia on the line? No, I'd rather not. Let's go to let's go to our recorded question. Let's hear the question. Jean-Claude Juncker, you were Prime Minister of Luxembourg for nearly 20 years. During this time, Luxembourg has strengthened its position as a financial centre in Europe. As President of the Eurogroup, you always opposed any measures that could jeopardise the financial interests of your country. Now, should you become the next President of the European Commission, would you be ready to defend and enhance transparency for the movement of capital? Like, for instance, raising the professional secret of uh, financial trust who organize this tax evasion? Okay, that was uh, Olivier from Belgium. I think we'll go to Slovenia now. Hello. Hi, how are you? Yes, I can hear you. Good. Let's Hi, have... I'm okay. Hi, Alicia. How are you? <laughs> Good, thank you, Alicia. Let's have your question, please. <laughs> Of course. Uh, well, in the past, the options for failing European banks have been either an unpredictable collapse or taxpayer bailout. In Slovenia, this was also the case. But recently, as we know, the European Parliament has adopted a new package of legislation set to protect European taxpayers and ordinary bank depositors from bank failure. Are these rules strict enough? And uh, how can you guarantee that European taxpayers will not have to pay for collapsed banks in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Bulgaria. And we have uh, Irina on the line. Irina, can you hear us? Yes, hello. Hi. Good afternoon from Sofia, Bulgaria, a state outside of the European Monetary Union. We know that. Uh, EU member states who are not members of uh, European Monetary Union cannot fully participate in the European Banking Union mechanism. So could you please specify what do you expect from the non-Eurozone member states? Challenges, obstacles, do you think that all member states should be in the European Banking Union or should countries like Bulgaria be kept outside of it? Thank you, Irina. Okay, Mr. Juncker, we'll start with you on this. Let's summarize two questions. Can you guarantee that citizens won't pay again for collapsed banks? And if yes, how? And should all member states be part of the banking union? I had the first question from your Belgium colleague, and I would like to respond to that question, which was not the question, but a provocation. Sure. Uh, first, I'm no longer Prime Minister of Luxembourg. I'm not asking Guy Verhofstadt what he did what is he doing now because he was a prime minister of Belgium and because Belgium adopted exactly the same uh, tax strategy when it comes to financial centers like Luxembourg because both of us, due to a European compromise I introduced when I was in the chair of the ECOFIN in 1997, we introduced a withholding tax in our countries and now we are moving in to the... Ex that was the decision. Yeah, so and it was, was not prime minister. No, no, no. That's why it was easy to make the decision. But when you were, <laughs> when you were prime minister, you, you, you did, you did, uh, you yeah. did take okay. the, the step. So uh, let's not uh, confuse these things. When I was president of the ECOFIN in '91, we harmonized the VAT. So Luxembourg had to increase by 3% its normal rate of uh, VAT, as Germany had to do. So saying that Luxembourg is blocking everything is simply not true. It's easy to say, it sounds good, but it is brutally, brutally untrue and uh, we, we have to react uh, uh, against that. And further progress has to be made in the area of uh, taxation. The European Union is working on uh, business uh, uh, taxation. We are working on broadening the uh, basis for uh, taxation of different financial products. So things are going their way. And by the way, I was not blocking progress in the tax area when I was in the chair of the Eurogroup, because the Eurogroup in no way has competencies to harmonize taxation in Europe. That's a matter for the ECOFIN. The Belgian colleague should be informed before trying to provoke me. And he succeeded, by the way, uh, uh, to do it. Your question was? 
the, the second part was to do with the banking union. Should yeah. all the member states be part of the banking union? Yeah. Yeah. Of course, uh, all the member states are concerned by the banking union and those who are outside the euro can join all the mechanisms which have been put into place uh, okay. as far as the banking union is concerned. Banking union, I don't like the expression by the way, I, I, I prefer the banking uh, uh, surveillance, is a model which uh, had to be adopted uh, recently by the parliament, the contribution of the parliament okay. is uh, of the highest importance. And this banking union is uh, the guarantee that never again we'll be in the very same situation we were in at, at the beginning okay. of uh, the crisis Schultz. because we have cut the link between banks and the sovereign. Okay, Martin Schulz, uh, are we going to pay for the banks all over again? The banking union, to answer to the question from the colleague in Bulgaria, uh, includes also those countries who are not members of the Eurozone. We have a combined structure. And because speculation could happen also outside yeah. the Eurozone and affect all of us. Therefore, it was necessary to combine the role of the European Central Bank with the role of the EBA, the European Banking Agency in London. That's what we did and all the member states are in with different systems and voting rights, but at the end they are in the banking union. Uh, the second question, taxpayers uh, paid for bank corrupt banks. Banks speculated and made profits and when they made losses, the bank taxpayers had to pay for them. The principle, taxpayer safe banks, what the principle of the European Union leading to uh, enormous mistrust. What the European Parliament did, and this is in my eyes one of the biggest achievements of our period, is to introduce the principle banks safe banks. We have a banking fund on a European level where banks have to pay in. It's a kind of assurance of banks. And if there is a bank in the risk, they have to pay from this banking fund. This is a new principle Perhaps not enough, because we, the European Parliament, we wanted to go further. The member states were reluctant. What did you want to do that the member states wouldn't do? To Europeanize the whole, the whole system and not to let at the end the decision making partially in the hand of the member states, which could lead at the end to the fact that the public budget pays and not the stakeholders, the shareholders and the deposit, depositors. So this, is, uh, okay. the, this was the main controversy between us and the member states. But at the end, the European Parliament achieved to introduce from a basic point of view the principle banks save banks and not taxpayers have to pay for speculants. Okay, Guy Verhofstadt. Yeah, maybe first on, uh, because uh, uh, we, we spoke about, uh, about Luxembourg, the, the new Prime Minister, Xavier Bettel, in, in any way, give up uh, the bank secrecy now. Uh, in a deal that has been made, in, uh, well, in, a, in a deal that has been made a few weeks that's, that's, that's uh, really, ago. But well, I don't want to enter no, no, into no, Luxembourg no, politics. Let's, let's, I'm not, let's no, go on to the Bank of England. I'm not so competent. No, no, I'm not so I. keen on, on, on that. I want to simply say what uh, Xavier Patel did as uh, the new Prime Minister, Liberal Prime Minister. When I was Prime Minister, I announced. We'll come back to that after. On April 10, 2013, the next time, the next time, I think you invite Xavier Patel, and he can have a direct debate with. I announced. Uh, back with, in uh, with uh, Mr. Juncker the about the this. banking secrets. But in on, the, on, the itself, on the content itself, on the content itself of the of the banking union, um, the banking union. Um, I, I think that we did a great job, but not enough. I, my fear is that the 50, 60 billion that are in the fund, when there arrives something with the bank, is not enough, and so uh, we need to uh, enlarge that system by making two types of contributions. I think that the contributions cannot be the same for all types of banks. For me, an investment bank has to give a higher contribution because an investment bank is representing a higher risk than a saving bank. An ordinary saving bank should have less, uh, less contributions, less high than uh, investment banks. That's the first thing. The second thing is that I think that um, banks have to do, uh, first of all, the funding now of this resolution mechanism so that taxpayers' money is no longer involved. They have to recapitalize based on the new rules of Pile 3. That's also a huge uh, task. And then we want also that banks give more money to the small and medium companies, the fastest as possible, because the credit crunch we talked in the beginning of the program is mainly the most problem. I think for doing that in the next year, the ECB, European Central Bank, has to come in. Has to come in to secure with what we call a new LTRO, a, a, a financing from the ECB. So to secure these two things. First of all, that that money is going directly to the fund, resolution fund, so that we are sure that no taxpayers' money can be involved to recapitalize a bank or to rescue a bank. 
And secondly, to make a condition that they only receive that money for the ECB if they transfer that money in cheap credits to the small and medium companies. Okay. That's absolutely necessary. Okay. Otherwise, we still have the credit crunch, we still are blocked, and we shall right. never emerge from the crisis. Uh, I must uh, let Mr. Juncker reply no, to no, Mr. Verhofstadt wait, first. Wait a minute. I'll, I'll come back in just a moment. Mr. Juncker, you can reply just for a brief answer, please. It's a pleasure. It was <laughs> unfair to say that the new Luxembourg Prime Minister abolished the banking secrecy. I announced that back okay. in April 2013. Okay. And as Mr. Verhofstadt perfectly knows, I was trying to do exactly the same thing, and that was always blocked by liberals in Luxembourg. Okay, Mr. Schultz, I'll try to come back to you tomorrow. I want to give Sky Keller an opportunity to speak on this first. It was exactly what I wanted to say, to be honest. Okay. I disagree on most on financial and tax question with Jean-Claude Juncker, but we should be honest. It was his government who announced the end of the banking secrecy. Mm. Xavier Bettel is much That's, near. You can rewrite wait history a, bit. a few okay. times. No, wait a minute the, now. No, no, he we, is we much, he's much near. Better is much nearer to me. We must give Scott Keller an opportunity to speak question, but no, this Keller, is a question of honesty. Do we need, do we need this uh, is really a all member states in the banking union? I think we need to continue the banking, you make it much stronger because the capital requirements, for instance, on banks, that's not enough. We need to make sure, really make sure, that it's not the citizens that are bailing out banks, but it's the owners of the banks who are doing their share. We need to put an end to this financial speculation that is throwing around money, like speculating on food, for instance, on stuff that is really necessary for people's survival. There we need to get in. And we also need to stop banks throwing people out of houses like it's happening in Spain, where people end up in homelessness, but they keep their debt to the bank. They, keep co they continue paying to the bank, even though they have lost their houses. This is incredible. Do you all agree this with is that? a scandal. Does everyone agree with that? And this is also part of social justice. I think the tax justice, that everybody pays their their fair share of tax, and that especially goes for big companies, that is also part of uh, social justice. We can't say, you know, let the poor people pay for, pay for the rule of law, for the parks, for the kindergartens. That's everybody's share. Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Scholz, your final comment on this? I agree. That, that was, I said, at the very beginning of our meeting here, our discussion, taxpayers pay for losses uh, of speculants who pay nothing as, from, as taxes when they make enormous profits. But we have, I think, a conclusion now, uh, and uh, I want to get back to one of uh, the events. Okay, we're close to the end of our time, so let's make it quick, yeah. please. Uh, people in the demonstrations... Sorry? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, people in the demonstrations claim uh, Europe saved the banks and not the people. What part of this is true, Ms. Keller? That's true. Well, it has been true in the past, but we should make sure that this has never happened again. I want a Europe that cares about the people, about the needs of the people. For that, I think we need more social rights in Europe. Europe should take more, co take more care of the social rights of people and regulate banks more clearly. And for that, I'm also really shocked that the Commission wants to also talk about financial regulation in the transatlantic free trade agreement, because the European Commission is asking our, the US government to lower their financial market regulation and this is not the policy I want to see in the European Union. Well, okay. uh, the, um, yes, maybe uh, Eurosceptics are always, uh, they are not here, but Eurosceptics are always attacking Europe and saying Europe is the cause of this, this is the is cause of attack. that, sorry, is the origin of that. And what we see here, this, sorry, a good is example, that is that the banking union, the banking union, uh, and Europe has created a banking union with rules that it did not longer taxpayers were paying. That's a European regulation which is making it impossible that uh, taxpayers are paying the bill for losses on a national level. And that's a well, good answer for me to your skeptics that Europe is really the solution for our crisis and also for the other challenges in the future. But this claim, Europe save the banks and not the people, is not coming only from your skeptics. It's coming from the people going to demonstrations. Exactly, and that we have changed. So it is not Europe who saved the banks, sorry, it are national authorities who saved the banks. It were national governments who have or nationalized or put money in their banks. That was not Europe. There didn't exist a European supervisor at that moment in the beginning of the uh, crisis. We have created this European supervisor to no longer have this situation that it is national governments who are doing it. And we created a European regulation who makes it impossible 
possible that taxpayers' money is used to save banks. And that is what I'm saying. When we got a financial crisis and when banks were saved, it was by national authorities. Okay. And it is European authorities who make it impossible. And that's, for me, the best answer okay. we can give to Euroscepticism uh, today. Mr. Juncker, the final questions. We're, we're going to close in just a moment. So, Euro bonds, uh, is this uh, part of the solution for the future? You supported them in the past and you're not so clear about it now. In, in an ideal world, it would be the solution, but we are not living, unfortunately, in an ideal world. I was in favor of euro bonds in principle, but I always uh, said that some preconditions have to be fulfilled before you can launch euro bonds. And these preconditions are that we have a uh, by far better coordination of economic policies, that we have a greater European say when it comes uh, to national uh, budgets, when we have uh, given a certain number of reforms to the economic and monetary okay. union, then you can introduce euro bonds. If you, you would introduce euro bonds tomorrow morning, it wouldn't help uh, in, okay. in, in no respect. For one more answer on this. Mr. Scholz, perhaps. Uncontrolled uh, banks and irresponsible speculators led Europe to the deepest crisis in which we are now, and taxpayers have to pay for it. This is a reality. And uh, if I would become president of the European Commission, I will uh, put on my highest priority that such a development will become impossible in the European Union once more. OK. Yes, no answer, Ska and, and Guy. Uh, do we want euro bonds? Ska first. Yes, I think we need euro bonds for, because we are a common economic zone, so it also makes sense that okay. we have common bonds, but of course with common rules as well. Okay, Guy Verhofstadt. Yeah, everybody knows the answer. Yes, I'm in favor uh, of that, <laughs> but not in a way to make it uh, impossible for countries uh, or make it easier for countries not to do their reforms. I, I just uh, should create it by saying to the countries, those okay. who do their reforms, they can use the bonds. Excellent. Thank you so much. Best uh, luck with the campaign as it uh, continues. Well, that's it. 75 minutes, four candidates, 15 journalists. Thank you for joining us. You can share the debate online a little later, post it on Facebook and Twitter. Segments and summaries of the debate will be available too. Our thanks to Jean-Claude uh, Juncker, Sky Keller, Martin Schulz, and Guy Verhofstadt. Uh, thanks for watching. I'm Brian McGuire. And thanks for watching. I'm Ainara Vascognana. Don't forget to vote.